I want to read to you tonight a couple of verses because, uh, be quite honest, uh, uh, in these days I'm, I'm a little confused about uh, people, uh, about uh, uh, church, you know, uh, and I'll explain as I go because I want to preach on the value of the church. And, uh, you know, the church is the only thing that's holding back the wrath of God. Yep. His spirit and his saints. And when you go to the book of Revelation and it, you see that the church is gone, then basically what you will experience on earth is hell on earth, you know. And so the church is valuable. It's even valuable to the lost people because they don't even, and they don't even know it, you know, and so it's valuable. And the reason I want to, uh, I, I, why I say I'm confused, I'm confused with the lackadaisical commitment that the average church goer has. They don't value this. Right. I, I want to say this, and I don't... Uh, <laughs> This morning, one of the greatest messages I've heard, uh, even on that text, from our pastor. And, uh, you know, the church to me is kind of like a marriage. Brother Josh, it would be, be kind of odd if you had married your wife, went on your honeymoon, and you came back and she said, Where are we going? You say, well, I'm taking you back home. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, I'll be back over in a several weeks to check on you. You know, I wouldn't imagine you probably still wouldn't be, you probably wouldn't be married. And the reason I'm saying that is because I want you to understand that our God has feelings. He has feelings. And when people have a lackadaisical attitude about attending church because you're going to find out and you already know I'm not going to tell you anything new you're going to find out how much God loves the church and you know one thing that I have found in 43 years of marriage to my wife it's to my benefit to love some of the things that she loves amen you know you even have to love her family <laughs> Amen. You know, uh, she. You know, I mean, you just it's just part of the deal, you know. And you know, I'm. <laughs> and she has to love my family, you know. And so, what I'm trying to say is, when people have this attitude, and and it's not, it's everywhere. Right. The commitment to the church, you know, not only that that God has feelings. But you know, Brother Doug has feelings. Did you know that, Brother Bob? He has, you know, he comes up here and comes off like, you know, he, he's, he can carry the world, but he can't. He can't do it, you know. And for us to come up with puny excuses, and we use it under this terminology of uh, providentially hindered, and all that means is we're just too lazy to come to church. You know, that's what that means most of the time. Not all the time. I understand because I'm caught in that situation right now to where on Wednesdays I just can't, I can't come because of my work schedule and Rhonda's work schedule. We just can't do it. Uh, and when I retire, you'll probably see me more often on Wednesdays, probably every Wednesday. But there's not much commitment and, uh, you know, I, I've read for years the verse where it says, uh, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? And I always said, why, sure he will. And now I'm doubting it. Because faith will make you do right. This book right here, Brother Clint, it'll make you do right. You read this book because this is God's love letter to us. And he make, it'll make you do right. And it'll make you, you know, commit you know, that's why I don't go to too many weddings because I'm not invited. <laughs> and the reason I'm not invited is people aren't getting married. They just shack up. 
I think the Bible calls that fornication. I'm not, I'm not no rocket scientist, but I think that's what it calls it. And so uh, there's not much. They don't want commitment. They want the lifestyle that says, if I get fed up with you, I can go on about my business. When you, when you invest your life in a person, it's a lot harder to walk off, you know. And so, I, uh, you know, uh, I, I get frustrated and I get heartbroken over the church. I want to read you a couple just verses uh, out of Psalms. One will be in verse uh, 10 of chapter 84, and the other one will be Psalms 122, verse 1. I try to write these verses down for my sake because <laughs> that way I, I can kind of get through what I want to say and don't keep you till time to go to work in the morning. But in Psalms it says in verse 10 of chapter 84 it says, For a day in the courts, in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And I've thought about that. When the psalmist said, you know, uh, nobody puts an emphasis on opening the door. And if you have Brother Ray, <laughs> there's no need to emphasize it. <laughs> because he gets too busy talking to open the door. <laughs> but I thought another thing about do being a doorkeeper, you don't really have to have a college education. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer to open up the door. Anybody can do it. Really, if you've got enough strength. And then in Psalms 1, uh, 22, 1, it says, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. And I'm finding less enthusiasm in the church. But right off the bat, I want to tell you that I am thankful that I'm part of this church. Amen. Not just church, but this church. And I want to say this, if you don't feel the freedom to worship God, it is not this church's fault. It's your fault. Because there is freedom. I, since I've come here, I've learned the freedoms. And I've been in church over 40-something years. So you know when when there's binding, when there's when there's no liberty to worship, you know. But that is not the case here. So you have that liberty. And I've been to churches where, uh, man, I mean, whew, you, you just couldn't, you couldn't do it. They wouldn't let you. I mean, it was, just, it was just a binding. They didn't want that, you know. But here we see that the psalmist is telling us, you know, I was happy to go to church. It was, a, it was the delight of my day. And you know, sometimes if you talk to co-workers and if you go to work with church and they say, well, what'd you do? It was almost when you say, I went to church, like you wasted your weekend. But I want to say on the behalf of my Savior, this is the greatest time of my week is to be at church and to hear preaching like we did, to hear singing like we heard, and to hear the good news that Jesus Christ loves us more than we could ever, ever imagine. So when I thought about how valuable the church is, the first thing that come to my mind is the payment. Something is only as valuable as you, as much as you're willing to pay for it. And I, I, I thought about this, and you know the verse in Acts 20, 28, it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over that which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, I would like to say on God's behalf, not God saying it, but me, he overpaid. Because there ain't none of us in here worth what he done. 
But I thank God for it that he was willing to do that. That he was willing. Now, when you talk about the payment, I want to say that God paid the supreme price so that you could sit here tonight. So you could be here tonight. You could hear the singing. You could sit here without the policeman coming in and telling us we couldn't, we couldn't be in this building. We're, we're safe here right now. It may not always be like that, but I want to say that God dear price for you to be here tonight. He paid the supreme price. I mean there's no price when you start playing with paying with blood you pay a dear price. I paid a lot of stu a lot of money for a lot of things. Matter of fact I've overpaid for eggs lately. When you're paying six dollars for a dozen eggs that's too much. When you're paying three forty for gas that's too much. But I will say this, God paid too much, but he was glad to do it, and so was Jesus. And I'm glad that they were willing, both of them, to pay the price that Ron Little, someone who's nobody, has nothing to offer him, can do nothing for him, and can't even get out of bed without him, that he was willing to pay that price. What a price. I mean, uh, Brother Brian, I don't know, it's just crazy stuff comes to my mind. I remember watching uh, Good Morning America, and they were talking to this guy. He collected ink pens. He had one fountain ink pen he paid $14,000 for. And I thought, that guy's a moron. You're talking about paying supreme. And he had a little thing to stand it on. But I want to say that God paid a higher price for us. So that we could sit here. So we would have the liberty and the freedom to come and to worship him. Not only did he pay a supreme price. But he paid a suffering price. He didn't pay. It's one thing to go to work and put your hours in and draw your paycheck and go down to the bank and deposit your check or however they do it now uh, and you pay your bills. That's one price. But to pay the price that Jesus paid is unbelievable. That he was willing to go and stand and to be mocked made fun of and that the God of heaven would be the one who was stripped naked and beaten and beaten and beaten and his back was exposed and you could see his, uh, his insides and he was willing to do that and they put the crown of thorns on his head and the blood ran down through his beard and it dripped up off his feet and he didn't complain once I'm trying to tell you there was suffering so you could be here tonight an extreme amount of suffering but not only was there suffering but there were sacrifices that he made that you could be here he made a lot of sacrifices here's, here's Jesus who is God who owns everything who is everything there's nothing moves there's nothing breathes without him he turned his back on all of that and became a carpenter's son and would work in a carpenter's shop and make stuff with his uh, earthly dad and become that and sacrifice his glory the God of glory who the angels brother Doug talked about today would sing around his head and fly around his head and say holy, holy, holy this is the one who sacrificed who was hungry. The Bible says that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. That's a weird place to be led. So a lot of times, Brother Ray, we get the feeling that the Holy Ghost takes us to all these comfortable places. But that ain't what it did, he did for Jesus. He led him into the wilderness. And he had, he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And when he did, you know what happened? The devil came. And he was out there all a week and all alone and nobody there with him for 40 days. And the devil telling him he wasn't even the son of God. No matter how weak he got, he knows better than that. You know, that was a sacrifice. 
But did you know in his payment there was not only that, there was a separating price. Did you know, have you ever thought about this? That when the plan was before all the world was created, before the foundation of the earth, for the foundation of the world, they knew that Adam and Eve wouldn't want to hold up to their end of the deal. Which actually it wasn't Eve. God's deal wasn't with Eve. God's deal is always with man. You're responsible. You're the one that's supposed to lead your family. The man is. Amen? Before all of that, God knew that they wouldn't make it. He knew that. That's his called foreknowledge. When he knowed that, you know what he said? Jesus said, I'll go. And you know what he did? He separated himself physically from the very presence of his Father. Hmm? Think about it. Think about that. The, here they are. They've never been apart. As far as you could go back in time. Well, if there were, There's no time when God's concerned. There is no such thing as time. Time is earthly. That ain't got a thing to do with heaven. You get to heaven, there ain't going to be no time. But God the Father and God the Son had walked together all through wherever they were in heaven. Never separated. But can you imagine? Now, here's what happened. An angel came and told a little Jew girl that the Holy Ghost would overshadow her and she would become with child now here's Jesus he wasn't a baby whatever the first stages of birth is that's what he was in the womb of a woman you talking about being separated from God but let me say this at that stage he was still God now you, you might wrestle with that and say I don't understand it well just doing the crowd I don't understand it either but for nine months he germinated in that little girl belly and when he was born in that stable and they placed him in a manger he was God he's never quit being God he's always been God but now he's separated in his physical statue you know he talks to God and you know even when he got baptized God came down and talked and said this is my beloved son and who I'm well pleased I'd like to heard that you know and but then there was another time he was separated even worse than the first time Jesus hanging on the cross of Calvary and the lights went out and before they went out Jesus said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me he was separated spiritually. God could not look upon his son having become sin. He did not, listen to me, he, do, he did not have sin on him. He became sin. That anything that you can think of that is against God, that's what Jesus was. He was idolatry, adultery, fornication, rape, murder, incest, child molestation whatever you want to name that's what God in Jesus Christ was on the cross and God said I cannot look on my son in that condition and he was separated that's the price that Jesus was willing to pay so you could sit here today and hear me talk to you about him what a God we have what a savior what a savior we have in Jesus Christ but then I think about the church, not only the payment, how long will something last? The permanency of it. You know, uh, my, uh, I've got a kind of a problem with these cars. By the time I get mine paid off, it's wore out. I'm either going to have to start making more money or they're going to have to lower the price on these cars. I can't keep up with them. And they wear out before uh, 
I work with a guy. I forget what kind of car he's got. Uh, he was he was aggravated with his wife because she wanted this whatever it was, and so anyway, they ended up getting it, and they don't even have it paid off still. But it was out of warranty, and he had to pay sixty five hundred dollars to get the transmission fixed. <laughs> he just said, he told me, he said, I told her, don't let, let's don't even talk about it. We got to get the car fixed. Let's just get her fixed. Don't say nothing. Not very permanent. But the church, listen how permanent it is. In Matthew 16, 18, says, And I say unto thee, talking to Peter, that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, he said, this one, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to say this, the church ain't going under. Church ain't going out of business. It's going, Brother Brian, just like he said. He said there's going to be a lot, there's going to be a great falling away, Brother Ray, before, you know, before he comes back. And you look around. I'm not, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm telling you what, we got, we got the best church in this area that I know of. And they still won't come. Jesus could be preaching and they wouldn't come. Ain't got nothing. We got a great pastor. Huh? Got great people. It ain't got nothing to do with that, folks. It's got to do with what's going on in their heart. Huh? You fall in love with somebody, the, there ain't nothing to keep you away. You understand me? You fall in love with your wife, or your wife, you fall in love with your husband, you will fight for them till the day you have no breath left. And the reason why we've lost our fight is because our love is gone. Uh, see, the permanent, it's permanent. Why is the church permanent? Because Christ is the foundation. Uh, you can't get nothing better than that. You can't get a better foundation than Jesus Christ himself. If you build on the sand, your house will surely sink. But if you build your house on Christ, you will do nothing but go up. But we have people, they, they, they like this feel-good religion. And I like feeling good versus feeling bad. I ain't going to lie to you. I don't like feeling bad. <laughs> you know, I like when, you know, it's a shouting time. But I want to say this to you. God ain't going to let you shout all the time because you can't grow when you're shouting. And might I say this, if you was grown up, you might be shouting anyway. Y'all looking at me like I got grown another forehead. But what I'm trying to tell you is that we're living in a day where people want coffee and donuts at church. Huh? They want a Starbucks at church. This ain't what this is about, folks. This ain't about Starbucks. This ain't about this ain't about uh, lunch and dinner and all that. It ain't about that. This is about Jesus. Amen. This this building here is about the Lord. This ain't ain't got nothing to do with coffee and donuts. We're we're in a, we're in a condition, brother Ray, where people love to be entertained. They got Christian comedians. I say, don't bring them into the church. This is serious business. I'm not saying, I'm not against laughter. I love it. The Bible says a merry heart doeth good as a medicine. But sometimes we have to stick to the road, brother. And, you know, I told you before, Andy Stanley is playing four songs before his services of Led Zeppelin. If you don't know who that is, go on, go, uh, go on YouTube and put them in. They, they, you'll find out who they are. And they ain't got a thing in the do, world to do with God. Right, right brother Brian? They ain't got nothing to do with God. And this joker is building a church. Why? Be, but it is not founded on Christ Jesus because he wouldn't fill that church up preaching the truth. Why do you think we're empty, to, not empty, but emptier? Huh? People don't like the truth. Huh? I've had people lie on me. I thought, well, if you really want to hurt me, tell the truth. <laughs> it's a lot worse than a lie. <laughs> you, amen. Did you know that the church is not only the, the foundation is Christ, but look at what it says here. He said, 
uh, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. That means there's a fight against the church. Huh? You ain't going to start doing anything for God and the devil say, oh, they ain't going to do nothing. He don't care if it's a toddler. He don't want them to hear about Jesus. Huh? He'll do anything in the church to disrupt the service to keep someone from hearing the gospel. He's going to fight to the very bitter end. Uh, years ago, this couple that I know, they had a baby. And this baby grew up to be a toddler. And I don't know what happened to this kid, but it was every service. This kid would just start screaming bloody murder. These parents are good kids. They're good parents. They're not some jokers. They're actually, they're, they're, they're basically in tears trying to say, what can we do? They just tore his hide and took him outside. After enough of beatings, enough spankings, you know what? He sat on the front row with his mom and daddy. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying it's a fight, and you have to fight because the devil ain't going to give up. He, he, he's got his boxing gloves on and he'll bite you, he'll kick you, he'll gouge you, he'll do anything he can. Uh, that's just the way he is. He, you know, he, he, he's a dirty fighter, you know. He, 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 he fights. But now, listen, you see the finish of the church. Look at what it says. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. That means we're going to finish right. The church ain't going to go under and out of business. The true church is going to fight to the end. And Brother Bob, they're going to fight and they're going to finish right. You know what we're going to do? We're going to be standing here when the Lord comes back and He sets up in the clouds and He calls us home, Brother Ray, and we're going to descend out of here uh, to meet our Savior in the sky. Why? Because we're going to finish right. Why? Because we have the same thing in us that He is. The Holy Spirit. We're going to finish right. I know it's not popular. Everybody likes to come to church wearing uh, Bengals jerseys and flip-flops. Ain't popular to dress right. When most people wake up of a morning and they got their Walmart attire on. That's called pajamas. It ain't, you know, dressed and right. And I'm not saying you don't have to wear no suit. I ain't saying that. But I am saying this. You ought to wear decent clothes. Huh? Blue jeans, that's fine with me. I ain't got no problem with that. But I will say this. Make them fit. Amen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you're my size, don't wear a size 30. I'm not telling you my size, but it ain't a size 30. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I started, I ain't going to say it. I'm just shut up. I'm going to shut up right there. All I'm saying is, you know, God deserves our best. You know, and, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be harsh. I really am not. I, I, I'm just trying to say, I, I, it bothers me. It bothers me for my pastor's sake because I've been there. Let me tell you a little story. When I pastored, I had a lady in my church, her... I think it was her dad. He lived up the hill from the church. Around, and she would go to visit her dad. He was, well, he basically he ended up dying. And I, I told Rhonda, I said, well, she'll start coming to church. Nope. Brother Ray, I was walking over to the church one Sunday morning. I, I heard beep, beep. And it was her. I'm like, praise God. She ain't coming. Her daddy's in the grave. 
See, her daddy wasn't a problem. She didn't love her church. Hmm? Ain't that something? I, I've uh, had a lady in my church. She said, I can't come on Wednesdays. But my boys go to school. I get that. I know that. But, you know, we're usually out. We was out by 8 o'clock on Wednesdays. You know, 8, 15. And I'm thinking, how much sleep does these kids need? If I slept 10 hours, I'd have rigor mortis. Rhonda would call the corner. <laughs> these little kids got to sleep 10 hours. No wonder they ain't going to do nothing. No wonder they play video games. They're too lazy to do anything else. You sleep 10, you let a kid sleep. My grandma woke me up. This is how my grandmother woke me up, Brother Brian. Me and my brother. Boys, it's going on 7 o'clock. I'd get up and look at the clock. It's 5 after 6. But see, in her mind, it's over pointing that direction. <laughs> Amen. That's the way it was. Now listen, 1 Timothy three fifteen says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, in the pillar and the ground of the truth. You know, the church is the pillar for all truth. Amen. And that word pillar means to stiffen or support. And the word ground means the basis. You know what? All truth, there's no absolute truth, comes from the world. None. It all comes from the church. Amen. Mm, where we come from. Yeah. Do you know what the, the good thing about church is, Brother Bob? It builds character. They think sports builds character. That's a bunch of hogwash. Bunch of tattooed hippies with dreadlocks being overpaid and underworked. Mm. And everybody thinks they got the answers. They don't even know the questions. Mm. I'm just being honest. This church will build character. If you don't think so, look at our kids. Your kids. They're having character because of what your pastor has done for years past. What he's taught. Uh, standing in the church. Building character. Mm. Your, your children don't look like a bunch of thugs. They don't, look, they don't go around with their hat down and their pants down. Uh they have to hold their pants like this because their underwear is sticking out. Uh, you know why that is? That's because of your pastor and this church standing for the truth because a church will always build character. Uh, a church that ain't building uh, character is not a church. It's just a building with a church's name on it. Uh, uh, do you know what the church does? Not only does it build character, but the church will show you how to conduct yourself out in the world. Yeah. Now, I will say this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to just speak for me. I can't speak for you. I have met some people that I wanted to bust them right in the mouth. I ain't going to lie to you. They made me that mad. But I didn't. And it wasn't because I was a good guy. It was because I've been taught the Bible right. from the yeah. church. They, did, they, did they deserve to be busted in the mouth? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Did I? I did not. You all must have not met the people I've met before at work. Uh, yes. But the, because of this book and because of what I've heard, not through just pastors, but through people preaching and, and just going to meetings, Brother Eddie, I've heard people say stuff that's just stuck in my mind and it's caused me to say, this is how I need to live my life. This is how I need, not because of me, but because of this person named Jesus who suffered for me. Now, am I telling you that I've always handled every situation right? Absolutely not. Huh? Nope. And am I telling you that tomorrow I may handle it wrong? Yes. That's what I'm telling you. I don't want to. 
But I'm trying to tell you that, that this Bible and this church that we go to every service, there's something here that's building character and showing you how to conduct your life out there. Your Christianity ain't worth a hoot if you don't take it out there. If you tell filthy jokes just like your co-workers, it ain't helping you none. Huh? Your Christianity that's built in here should work out there. Let me say this. The church should strengthen your commitment. But I want to say it don't always. Because I see people that don't come back. And you're going to find I have a I kind of have a beef with that. Because it hurts what we're trying to do as a whole. It hurts my I know from being a pastor when you hear the puny excuses. You know, I can't come, my cat's sick. You don't think that happens. Your whole life, you think that you think that don't happen, huh? It happens. I, I can't come. You know, one kid gets sick in the whole neighborhood. That stay home. Now, I want to say this. I not without being insensitive. If there's somebody dying in your house, I, I don't have a problem with you stay. Or the whole family staying home. You just do it. You know, I don't have no problem with that. But if they just got a runny nose, you all don't have to stay home. The reason they don't stay is they're more committed to this kid. You know? I was telling you about the lady that had the kids. You know, she passed away at 54, and she had two boys, and neither one of them are going to church today. Let me say this. Your commitment will be handed down to your kids. If they see that this don't mean nothing to you, it won't mean nothing to them. He'll mean less to them. Because kids are taught directly and indirectly. That means they see you, and they say, well, he don't care. He, uh, you know, these, uh, I, let's see, yesterday, I, we live in, down by Owenton, so I went over to town. And the church, bro, uh, Brother Brian, had us thing out. Come join us, Easter, 11 o'clock egg hunt. I don't know. I I thought that was when we had church. Ain't that what time church starts? I, now help me here. They're having an egg hunt instead of having church? That don't make sense to me. Don't make sense. No commitment. Now listen. I thought of something else about about church. Do you know? I think uh, number one thing is found in the book of Ephesians about church. It says in chapter two, verse thirteen. It says, "But now in Christ Jesus, you sometimes were far off." made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers, foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Do you know what? This is the privilege of the church. You're not obligated to be here. You have the privilege to be here. Right. This is a privilege. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you know you can be a member? You know they got these things called the Moose Club. 
you can be a member of the Moose Club and you don't even have to be a moose. You just have to pay your dues. <laughs> I'm just saying. You, it's not really a privilege if you just got a few dollars to divvy up. But to be a member of the church, you have to be born into it. It's like being a part of the royal family over in England. I'm not part of that. I'm a hillbilly from eastern Kentucky. I ain't got nothing to do with that over there. But I do have something to do with this. Because I've, I've been born into this thing, body of believers. It's not by being baptized. It's not by having your church name, your name on the church. It's by you have to be born again. You were born, the only people that can literally be a member of the church have to be birthed. Right here he said it. In these verses. He, look, look, he said, But now in Christ Jesus, who you sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Do you know what? His blood has made you a privileged member of his church. By birth. You can be a member of anything in this world all you have to be is recommended. Won't help you here at all. At the church, recommendation won't help you. Your certificate of baptism won't help you. Your friends can't help you. But being born again is the only thing that you can offer Him to be a part and to be a privilege of His church. You all have to be born again. Huh? But the privilege that this church offers is that has benefits. You know, uh, I had a uncle by marriage. He was, they have this thing up there called the Fraternal Order of the Eagles. All it is where people pay to go get drunk and play pool. Huh? That's, that's what it is, ain't it? Now, he would go down there and play pool and drink, you know. All he had to do was have somebody tell him and bring him before whoever the grand poobah or whatever they are. And they vote. And they're going to vote yes because they get membership dues. Okay. Well, see, the church has some benefits too. There's some benefits to being in the church. Now, what are they? The Bible says... In verse 14, for he is our peace. Do you know what this world can do? It can strip me of everything I own, but it cannot take the peace that God has put in my heart. He can take my peace physically, but he cannot take the satisfaction that Jesus Christ is my Savior. He's given me a benefit called peace. I can sleep tonight no matter how much the storms roll, how big the waves get, how much the devil roars. Because of him and his blood, I have peace. When troubles come and they come frequently... Big and small, I have peace. I'm not saying that I don't get upset and have, you know, days you want to quit. I ain't saying that. But I'm saying because of Him, I haven't. Do you know another fit benefit? He said He removed, having abolished in His flesh the enmity. That means God ain't mad at me no more. Uh, uh, my dad, he, he was not a timeout. He didn't have timeout. You know what I'm saying? He didn't, he didn't say, okay, you go sit in the corner. Timeout was when he stopped to get another switch. No. My dad did do that. That's why I didn't like it when we were at, at odds. I didn't want him as my enemy. 
The night that I got saved, Brother Clint, there was peace that give, removed all the enmity that God was satisfied with what went on there at that altar. The enmity, we, we are no longer at odds with each other. I'm for God and God's for me. God is, I, I, you know what God says? Uh, he lets me know I want to do what He wants me to do. Amen. I am for Him. I'm not for this world. Huh? That's one of the benefits. But you know, another benefit in, in, is that he's, he's given me the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me. And this Holy Spirit, He guides me in big ways and little ways. He talks to me. Hmm? I was watching a preacher one time and he told the story uh, uh, that he was off preaching a meeting and got the news that his son had died. And the church that he was holding the meeting for, they said, uh, we will pay for your ticket to fly back. He was from, I think, West Virginia or Virginia, one of the two. And he said, no, I, I want to drive because I want to talk to God. And uh, he said on the way there, he talked to God all the way home about his son. And said, somebody ask him, so you're telling me that God talked to you audibly? He said, no, it was clearer than that. I'm telling you, he don't leave us out drowning. Uh, but in the privilege we have this building of the church you know the reason I'm here because God said I'm part of this building Ray you're here because God says you're part of this he's not talking about all this drywall and stuff he ain't talking about that he's talking about people sitting everywhere they're, they're <clears throat> you're here brother Bob because Bob uh, for God said that you and your family needs to be here. He's put you as part of this church. Whatever you're to do, you're to do that. Hmm? Brother Clint's here. What a blessing. Uh, amen. Stayed here. Hmm. You know what God did? He, it's just like building a, a wall to a building. You take two by fours, they're just single, but then you start nailing them together and standing them up. Before you know, you've got four walls. Uh, and you know what God's doing? He's just building, taking a two before and a two before here and a two before here and a two before there. And before you know it, we've got a church house. Uh, and Brother Doug has got somebody to preach to. I say praise God. Do you ever think about, uh, this might be an odd verse that I'm going to read to you. Uh, <laughs> I, the last thing I want to talk to you is about the power that's in the church. Now, <clears throat> you all know this story. In Acts 20, verse 7, said, Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in the window a certain man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep this must have been a Baptist church and as Paul was long preaching he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead and Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said trouble not yourselves his life is in him now I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen at our church. Somebody's going to fall over dead and Brother Doug's going to go over there and he's going to raise. I ain't saying, that ain't what I'm trying to, I'm trying to use a spiritual application here. But the power of God is revealed through preaching. It ain't through shouting. Preaching. God always commands us to preach the word. He said, be instant in season and out of season. What does that mean, preacher? That means when they like it and when they don't like it, just keep on preaching. Just keep telling them Jesus saves. <laughs> Preaching is a powerful weapon. It'll break. It'll tear down. It'll build up. 
It's revealed. Did you know that preaching is not only uh, the power is revealed through preaching, but it's revealed personally. You know, Brother Peter, when that guy died and Peter, uh, Paul went down there, that was personal. Uh, you know, when God, when God was ringing my bell back there this uh, morning, I, I was enjoying that, that singing. I was enjoying that preaching. Why? Because it was to me personally. There was something boiling, bubbling over inside of me. Why? Because this thing is personal. You got to take it personally. Uh, you waiting for somebody else to get excited? What about you? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. What about me? Last of all, do you know preaching is revealed through a person? It was revealed through Paul. Paul was telling them, you know, we don't like long preaching. We don't like preaching at all. But I will say this: God takes His preacher and uses him. To say things that will help you. Don't buck against him. Just say amen, it's me. I need it. But I thank God for the church. I thank God for this church. Brother Josh, you come. I am done. Thank God for my church. For my church family. For, for some place where I can come and hear about the Lord. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.